In part one, we discuss the news reports on the Pentagon's Advanced Aerial Threat Program, formed to study and identify UFOs. I demonstrated how that story was not at all what it seemed. The videos we were shown do not prove that alien craft visit our skies, or that the UFO phenomenon represents any type of threat. I, for one, am shocked. I had no idea that the mainstream media was even capable of misleading viewers. In part two, I made a case that the recent disclosure of UFOs in the news was not even a true disclosure, as none of the information came directly from the government. The information we got mostly came from this sketchy-ass googly-eyed mother we, uh, we may not be alone. It's much more likely that the ex-government officials involved are dishonestly overhyping the UFO phenomenon as part of a guerrilla marketing campaign to draw attention to their new company, To The Stars Academy, a media corporation that claims to have the means to build their own UFO-style technology. And you know they're serious because the head of the company is a musical genius. Your time on me! I hate that guy. The really confusing part about this is that the investment money wasn't their only end goal. They may have been using some smoke and mirrors to convince us that UFOs are some sort of threat. You're obsessed with UFOs. We call these advanced aerial threats. They're different, but... Threats? Why the hell do they keep throwing this term at us? How does spreading paranoia about an alien invasion help attract investors? The idea that these things are a threat is absolutely ridiculous to me. After thousands of sightings with millions Millions of witnesses and countless hours of video footage, if these things could do any kind of physical harm to us, there would be proof of that and the whole world would know about this shit by now. Perhaps they were just trying to speak the language of their target demographic, the UFO community, and drum up some extra interest by offering people a fake solution to a fake problem, like some sort of a shitty infomercial. <laughs> Are you tired of the constant threat of giant mole people surfacing in your backyard and eating your children? Stop mole people in their tracks with Ground Fence. The first fence that allows children to walk freely in their backyard without fear of being dragged deep into the cold, cold ground. Ah, f I can't get them! But does the UFO community really believe an alien invasion is imminent? Some say these beings live outside the Earth and tease us with UFOs for pleasure. No one knows for sure, but I intend to find out. Reboot! This video is going to be a little bit different than the others in the series. This is meant as more of an open discussion about the UFO phenomenon and a description of all the different groups that are interested in the subject. After watching hundreds of hours of lectures and reading dozens of papers on UFOs, trying to make sense of a minefield of conflicting information, the whole thing just starts to feel like total nonsense. 23 different species are coming because they don't want anything to do with us. I don't think we will ever have a formal relationship, a formal contact with any alien species out there, especially after 9-11. When we broke our toys in the sandbox, if they were observing that, goodbye human race. Thank God this is my last video on the subject, because I'm getting really burnt out on UFOs. So let's just have some fun with this one and play around with a few different theories. The UFO community is really hard to define. There are people from all walks of life who believe all sorts of ridiculous, conflicting, contradictory stories. Scientifically minded people tend to believe that UFO sightings represent some sort of alien or military technology. Devout religious types tend to believe that there's some sort of demon or spirit, and New Agers insist that aliens are trying to help humanity ascend to a higher level of consciousness and replace all of the masculine, patriarchal religions of the world with the sacred feminine. Ugh. And nobody wants that. We have three basic schools of thought here. The first, UFOs are some type of non-terrestrial spacecraft transporting aliens. Second, UFOs are top secret military aircraft. And third, UFOs themselves are some type of ethereal beings or spirits. There's an awful lot of overlap between these ideas, of course. The most common type of UFOlogist sits right 
here. The theme of aliens visiting Earth in flying saucers has been a staple of pop culture since the 1950s. One thing that ties most media in this genre together is they often depict aliens as being hostile or even evil. Most commonly, they're depicted as little green men with big eyes. We've all grown up exposed to the idea that hostile aliens one day could come and invade the Earth. I'm not saying we're being manipulated, but at very least you could argue that this has influenced the general public's ideas on what aliens could be. When the average person pictures an alien in their head, they see a skinny little humanoid with giant heads and big eyes, traveling across the galaxy in a silver shiny flying saucer. But how did this concept evolve? Ufologist Stanton Friedman seems to think that this is a legitimate theory. The evidence is overwhelming that planet Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. In other words, some underlying 36 times some UFOs are alien spacecraft. We're dealing with a cosmic water gate. That means governments have been not telling us the truth. I won't say they were lying, they were, but they created a, a fantasy. We're dealing with the biggest story of the millennium. Certainly, the idea of flying saucers became popular during the Roswell incident in 1947, when some type of technology crashed in New Mexico. Before the Air Force got a chance to make an official statement, early news reports claimed that it was a flying saucer. The Air Force demanded that the newspapers report that it was a weather balloon. But it was too late, the story was already out there and the way that the Air Force reacted suggested a possible cover-up. We also grow up being taught evolution. They say our ancestors were great apes, and we slowly turned into the sleek, smooth, intelligent creatures we are today. What a pile of horse that turned out to be, am I right? <clears throat> Excuse me. The average person imagines evolution as a constant progression into perfection. Pair that with the way that we're taught history, a constant progression of technological capabilities, morality and philosophy. It's natural we imagine that a civilization that's developed technology that's so much more advanced than ours must also have evolved further than us. In the 1950s, the cultural belief was that the rocket and the jet were stepping stones to even greater things. Hover cars and cars colonies on the moon. It seemed as if the future had no limits. Surely this technological progress had no plateau and would scale upwards infinitely. People were sold a future where space travel would be accessible to the average person. Naturally, people concluded that if we could do that, so too could an alien civilization from a faraway star. And surely if they had the technology to travel such a distance, they would also have to be very evolved. Boom! Little green men in flying saucers are born. The large brain skinny humanoids with delicate features is just our perception of our own evolutionary future. This is our idealized version of where evolution and technology will take humanity. It's basically an expectation now, a byproduct of the future that was sold to the space age generation through entertainment and media. Even more proof that the boomers are the worst generation. Bob Lazar, famous for being a whistleblower, claims he worked for the United States military at Area 51 as an engineer tasked with studying flying saucers and back engineering them to help the military build their own ships. Bob claimed these craft were extraterrestrial and far beyond the abilities of human technology. He managed to properly predict the time and place of some sort of UFO test around the airbase, and when that was filmed by the media, it launched Bob into instant fame. But after years of scrutiny, his story is not really held up. His educational background, for example, was a complete lie. He never attended MIT or Caltech like he claimed. He also claimed to know about a yet undiscovered element, 115. We've discovered it now, but the one we found did not have the same isotope that Bob claimed. Bob is incorrectly credited as being the person who exposed the existence of Area 51, but people actually already knew about that airbase. He instead is actually known for outing a specific location of an even more secret part of Area 51 called S4 at Papoose Lake. But satellite imagery suggests that no such facility exists. Now, certainly, to get a job in an above top secret facility, you'd have to pass a rigorous background test. But Bob had friends who were avid ufologists, including John Lear, known for the Lear jet. Before this whole incident, John had already confronted the Air Force about secret aircraft he personally discovered being tested. John Lear would go out to Area 51, look around, take photos like these, and he knew that something like a stealth fighter was flying around out there. So he and his buddy Jim Goodall told Ned Day. 
Ned Day breaks the story. It goes national. It goes international. Surely Bob Lazar wouldn't ever get clearance to step foot in that base if he had a friend that actively spies on the military. You may assume that it was John Lear that convinced Lazar to come forward. The way Tom DeLong tells the story, Bob came forward because of other circumstances. They found that his wife was going a little haywire because he couldn't tell her what she was what he was doing. And he would leave in the middle of the night, he'd be gone for a week, and she was getting fed up. And so she started having an affair. And so they're listening in on all the phone calls and checking them out, and they're kind of going, his home life is unstable. So they stop calling him to come into work while they figure it out. He knows that, uh, that this is no fucking joke. And no one knows what he's been doing. He thought he did something wrong. So as the nervous individual he is, he runs to, the, to his friends and says, this is what I've been doing. This is what I've been working on. There's alien craft. It's over here at Groom Lake. And the tests are every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. Conspiracy theorist, ufologist, and reporter George Knapp still believes Bob is telling the truth, but George built his entire career off of the Bob Lazar story. George has every reason to perpetuate this lie. But I've basically concluded that Bob Lazar is a liar, and it was John Lear that put him up to it. Bob is just an actor or a character, if you will. That's my driveway, that's Bob, that's Gene Huff, and uh, Bob's wife Tracy and Chris, and uh, we're just waiting there for uh, five o'clock to roll around. Yeah, he was nervous because he was putting it all out on the line there, and uh, here he was gonna, you know, reveal all this secret that he'd signed, you know, that he was gonna uh, never tell anybody. Oh, how bright it's getting! Look at it now. And just a few minutes ago, we saw one of the government uh, uh, extraterrestrial UFOs. John Lear had already discovered secret craft being tested by the military, and was already in talks with George Knapp trying to expose this. John Lear gave us that information about stealth technology, so he had credibility with us. He walked into the station with a big stack of UFO documents and dropped them on Ned's desk, and uh, Ned said, look, I'm not interested in this. I can't do this story. So I started reading his pile of UFO documents. It included the MJ-12 papers and some other things, citing reports. The third time I had John on this program, he slipped a hint that he knew a guy who'd just been hired at Area 51. Don't want to say too much about it, but if this goes public, if he goes public with the information, it's going to blow the lid off this story. Well, the guy that he knew turned out to be Bob Lazar. Likely, John had noticed a specific test being done every week at the same time and used Bob as a way to present this to the general public. He molded Bob into a character, an engineer who works on alien craft, and John presented his findings through the character of Bob Lazar. John Lear managed to turn a video about a light that flew across the sky in the desert into some grand story about alien technology being built by the military. And people ate this sh up. Stanton Friedman, too, has his reservations about the Bob Lazar story. I did a lot of checking on Bob. I tried to meet with him twice. I was supposed to on one occasion, and he didn't go along. I checked with his high school. He finished in the bottom third of his high school class. You can't get into MIT if you're outside, usually the top 10, 15, 20 percent of your class. Bottom third, never. His Element 115 scheme won't work. Sounds good, science fiction. Oh, I checked with Los Alamos. He is in the phone book there. Doesn't that prove that he was a scientist working there? No, it certainly doesn't prove he was a scientist, but if you look at the phone book page, it says K slash M. That's Kirk Meyer, a subcontractor. He worked out at the Maison facility. Don't need a clearance for that. People come in from all over the world, physicists, to do experiments, and he was a technician working out there. But the stories that Bob has told, and the drawings that he's shared, are still spread across the UFO community like holy dogma. The second major group of UFO believers that I want to talk about is a specific type of conspiracy theorist, the religious fanatics. I'm going to focus on the Christian ones. These religiously minded conspiracy theorists tend to be obsessed with end time prophecy. A perfect example is KJ from the YouTube channel. Channel, scariest movie ever made. KJ often showcases various supposed paranormal videos and then ties all of these things into the book of Revelation, trying to make a case for the coming of the end times. When I was religious, I believed a lot of this stuff, and even then I had a lot of trouble trusting half of what KJ was showing. But as it pertains to UFOs, the Christians have a very interesting perspective. The vast majority of UFO sightings are just balls of light, and the military has been reporting these ever since World War II with the Foo Fighter phenomenon. In their mind, these are not physical craft, but instead these are ethereal beings, like demons or spirits. I mean, look at this. 
Does that look like anything you've ever seen before? This isn't your typical UFO type footage, right? To me these look like beings. This looks like some kind of a battle. Some people even titled this UFOs fighting over Nevada. Are these entities, are these spiritual entities we're seeing? Are these glimpses of a quote, war in heaven? The veil truly is lifting. This particular theory is kind of fun and interesting, and it actually almost makes sense in a weird way, as these balls of light seem to move as if they're being intelligently controlled. But it's much more likely that these are meteorites or some type of electrical phenomenon like ball lightning. Oh, and their explanation for the physical craft? Instead of aliens, they believe that these beings are fallen angels. The world is flat. <laughs> Part of the helicopters that you see up in the sky are really fallen angels. The Antichrist is about to rise up onto the scene. The millions of hybrid babies, part alien, part human, that are now running our government. They are now running our major hospitals and our police departments. Tillian hybrids, for the most part, the ones that are doing this, the ones that are running everything are humanoids. They look human on the outside, yet their physiology is slightly different, and they are in a demonic state. Yeah, so that all ties up neatly into a nice little bow. The religious conspiracy theorists tend to see this type of thing as a form of spiritual warfare, and the enemy they fear most is the New Agers. The New Agers believe a little bit of everything, just like the Christians. They're basically like two sides of the same crazy coin. Many also believe that aliens are psychically communicating with them, and others claim to channel aliens. <coughs> As we have been called the bringers of the dawn. Now when I see this sort of thing, I think, this is a crazy person. But when a Christian sees this, they think, Oh yeah, that's a demon possession right there. A perfect example of one of these New Agers is David Wilcock. He is just an endless supply of cringy, hilarious nonsense. This is what you actually saw. And I was there as we constructed this, and it was very emotionally powerful for me. I actually broke into tears as this image was appearing. So we're seeing a being that looks pretty human-like, but it's got small, fine feathers all over its body, right? Then we have the golden triangle head beings, which have some unpronounceable name. Here's what they look like. Now, how tall was this guy? 10 feet. So he's even taller than Blue Avian, because the Blue Avian, you said, is 8 feet. Yes. I could really do an entire video on this guy. He believes that he's the reincarnation of Edgar Cayce, a New Ager from the turn of the century. David also claims that he's the reincarnation of the Egyptian god Ra. I am Ra. The world of energy that you dance through may be invisible to your physical eyes of the flesh. Well, David apparently is both the reincarnation of Ra and also channels raw so yeah i don't know how that's supposed to work apparently these aliens lay out a plan for humanity to enter a new level of consciousness that will allow humans to evolve into godlike beings most new agers say shit like this i really like to play along with conspiracies like this for fun to see how far i can go with it but we're just getting into nonsense territory here just think about this if an alien species wanted a truly friendly trusting relationship with humanity would they achieve that by sending brain signals to sketchy ass goofballs hopped up on peyote or would they physically come and interact with us in person it seems manipulative really okay that's enough of that shit. I find the whole fake alien invasion idea really interesting. If they really could fake such a thing, it would really fuck the whole world up. In 1974, after being a sixth grade school teacher, I was introduced to the late Dr. Werner von Braun in the U.S., the father of rocketry. In my first meeting with him during that first three and a half hours, he said to me, Carol, you will stop the weaponization of space. And we have to prevent the weaponization of space because there is a lie being told to everyone 
that the weaponization of space is now first being based upon the evil empire, the Russians. There are many enemies, he said, against whom we're going to build this space-based weapon system. The first of whom was the Russians, which was existing at that time. Then there would be terrorists. Then there would be third world countries. Now we call them rogue nations or nations of concern. Then there would be asteroids. And then he would repeat to me over and over, and the last card, the last card, the last card would be the extraterrestrial threat. The third group I want to discuss is the Disclosure Movement. This is, hands down, the worst group of them all. The New Agers are clearly off their rockers, yet somehow the Disclosurists are a million times more frustrating to listen to. First off, they're not even really all that into disclosing things. They're more like Disclosure artists. They tell a lot of stories almost exclusively about themselves. They all claim to have inside sources and to have read real military documents, though they never show any of these documents or photos or videos in their presentations. It's just absolute insanity to listen to. Yes, Tom DeLonge is a disclosure artist, but Dr. Stephen Greer is like the king of disclosure. There's a handful more of these guys and they all have one thing in common. The number one thing they have is they have massive egos. Is they all absolutely believe they're messiahs. They absolutely believe that they have been called to release this story to the world, that they got picked. This really goes for most personalities in the UFO community. The whole genre attracts people who are willing to make up complete lies about themselves for a chance to seem really important, get famous, and make money. It's like the moment these people learn that UFOs exist, they act like they've been chosen by God to tell the world about it, so they travel around the United States telling stories and selling books. So I'm Dr. Stephen Greer, and I'm the founder of the Disclosure Project and the Center for the study of extraterrestrial intelligence and the Orion Project. Dr. Stephen Greer is the founder of the Disclosure Project, an organization made up of government and military insiders, as well as eyewitnesses and activists. Just like Tom DeLong, Greer has several inside sources who are invested in the subject of UFOs and extraterrestrials. But what's interesting is that Greer's main source is Lawrence f***ing Rockefeller. Yes. I'm a country doctor in North Carolina, rambling around in an ER. I'm doing this sort of as just an ad hoc group. He says, no, well, it, someone is going to have to do this, uh, but also is going to have to educate the public. And I said, well, I'll do what I can in between ER shifts and raising four children. Lawrence Rockefeller could have used anybody, but for some reason, Lawrence Rockefeller decides to make some random ER doctor the head of his UFO disclosure project? That makes no f***ing sense at all. The Rockefeller family up to their eyeballs in this. Lawrence knew that, but he was on the side of the angels. He wanted to sort of cleanse the karma, as it were, I believe, uh, of that family and actually help. So a lot of people have, of course, attacked me for knowing a Rockefeller uh, as proof that I'm sort of part of some cabal. I said no, they contacted me because he, Lawrence, knew that what we were doing was really novel and was effective because he had sent people, it turned out, to some of our events where we had had contact. He found out what we were doing and his people said, you've got to get involved with this. So Lawrence wanted to play a behind the scenes role. Whoa. I can't believe it. But everyone loves Stephen Greer. It's so stupid. Listen to how Stephen Bassett, the founder of a separate disclosure group, introduces Greer. One of the people that's influenced me the most since I entered the field in 96 is our speaker. Because of his intensity, because of his intelligence, because of his indomitable will, his absolute perseverance, this is what you have to have to be a change agent. I only aspire to this level. If you would, a very loud round of applause to a very powerful man, Dr. Stephen Greer. It's like a f***ing cult. What the f*** is this sh They all make up their stories about what's really going on, and they try to make their own personal story about their own personal experiences, and just like Star Wars fans, they try to fit it all within the canon of what other people say is happening. The helmet had a raised ridge that ran from between his eyes to the back of his head where it merged into durasteel, obsidian, and plastisteel. 
What's plastisteel? It's steel with plastic. Well, that means it looks like cheap plastic made in 1977. And it grows into this complete belief system. People keep stepping forward as if they're prophets to these alien gods. It's just a UFO religion. I can't believe it. You would think that if you had vast, endless knowledge of the ins and outs of the United States government's involvement with aliens and UFOs, you would tell your audience specific facts about these subjects. If you knew how aliens made their spacesuits, for example, you would describe the technology to your audience and also describe how you learned this. But that's not exactly how Steve does things. This person contacted me to find out something that had bugged him, it's, been, it's, it's stuck in his mind and bothered him for 40 years. And I said, well, what is it? He says, these little men were in <laughs> sort of these metallicized fabric, it was almost metal, metal, soft metal like fabric, one piece suits. I said, yeah, like a onesie, but it didn't have any buttons or zippers. And he said, they, how could they have gotten in them? And I said, this is why you're calling me? <laughs> and I said, well, I don't know if you're going to like my answer. And he said, well, tell me. I know those damn things, you could have to cut them off, but we couldn't even cut them. I said, well, the way that they, that suit is made, they just stand into an energy field that has a resonant and it materializes around them. Like 3D printing, but like a three, zip. Last year, just before I had to take this trip to Australia, and I was laying on the beach, you see the whole Milky Way galaxy. I was out there and we were talking about this stuff. And suddenly, in the Milky Way, an object materialized, and it was this beautiful kind of crimson, ruby red, but it was, live, it was like it was living. It was like this thing that was living, and it moved. It wasn't an instantaneous thing. It was there for a little while. I don't know if anyone else on Earth saw it, but we saw it. We were looking straight up. It was like it was alive. The sky was alive. The object was alive. And I realized it was going right in the direction of Australia, which a few days later, I was wheels up to Australia. I told my wife, I said, I think they were telling me, you know, bon voyage and we'll be with you there. So, so it, it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. Hmm. Interesting how this disclosure of how aliens make their f***ing uniforms somehow turned into a story about how smart and awesome Steve is. Where does Greer fit in on this Venn diagram? Sort of in the center, you might think? No, Steve is the entire f***ing diagram. He tries to use all of the ideas from all of the groups and pushes them all as equal. He says that aliens are real and they fly around in spaceships. Oh, whoa. Oh my okay, goodness. Okay, let's welcome them here. Oh, they're, they're so beautiful. They, they were waiting for us to arrive. So connect to them in your consciousness and invite them here. Let's welcome their uh, beings on board to join us in meditation. So open your heart chakra and send them the beauty of humanity. Apparently, he also believes that there's going to be a fake alien invasion. We're getting closer to the hoaxing of events to stampede the world into something that would make 9-11 look like a picnic. A longitudinal, long-term, multi-generational program to hoax a threat from outer space. But also, the spirit beings also exist on top of that. They can put someone into a state and they can go into a lower or denser astral field, and some would call this demonic, and they can actually see beings and creatures there and bring them in three-dimensional and materialize them flesh and blood through these electronics. But it's okay because they're good ones and we can talk to them and channel them if we want to? You arrive in this universal state of consciousness. From there, you can then learn how to remote view space and how to contact these ETs and then how to invite them into your area. Awesome. This guy is all over the fucking map. Yet somehow he is one of the most revered UFOlogists on the planet Earth. And this is why the UFO community f***ing sucks. It's just storytellers giving dopamine highs to idiots who want to be fooled. Some of us um, are aware of the extraterrestrial beings genetically mixing with some human beings. 
And I personally think this is a very positive thing. It's like a creepy pasta that's just gone too far. It's a completely disjointed mess of egomaniacs and morons who don't want to know the truth. Pair that up with the military and CIA's vested interest in spreading disinformation to completely confuse the community. This is exactly why there is no good information about UFOs. But I've got the real scoop, folks. I'm, I'm gonna tell you exactly what's going on with UFOs. I'm, just, I'm gonna give you the short version and then you can buy my book afterwards to find out the rest. You ready? Buckle up, mother Yes, there are aliens that visit us, but they aren't what you think. When they make psychic contact with a human, they usually portray themselves as a gray alien, but that's not quite what they are. They sometimes teach humans how to build technologies, but the information that they share with us doesn't come from futuristic aliens from far away. It comes from a time in the distant past here on Earth. A long time ago, a race of beings lived with us here on Earth, a silicon-based life form that was sometimes called gods, angels, even elves. Their silicon skin would appear white, blue, even green. Sometimes it looked like it had scales, so early humans mistook them as fish people or lizard people. These beings ruled us as gods and even warred with each other. All ancient flying saucer technology comes from them. These angels fell from grace and their human hybrid offspring eventually died off. Most of them in the Great Flood, which wasn't 5,000 years ago like the Bible says. It was closer to 13,000 years ago. When a comet hit the Earth during the Ice Age, quickly melting the polar caps, wiping out all civilization, forcing humanity to start again. These godlike beings are still out there, and they are watching us. The Moses Exodus myth is based on a Sumerian tale that describes a time when humanity was liberated from an evil alien by a good alien. This is depicted in Sumerian art. At the turn of the 19th century, people within both the United States and Germany were becoming obsessed with the occult. During World War II, Aleister Crowley was the main influence for the entire movement. Crowley's wife began channeling a cosmic being that looks an awful lot like an alien gray. This being shared information about magic and technology with Crowley, who then passed it on to the Nazi SS, Hitler's own occult organization, which also was communicating with their own beings that were being channeled through the Vril Society. Hitler used his military resources to travel the world in search for ancient occult artifacts, including technologies that were left behind by the people who built the pyramids. They used what they found to build an anti-gravity device they called the Bell. When they first tested it, the plasmatic mercury engine kicked out so much radiation, it melted everyone within a 1,000 yard radius. This was portrayed in Ark of the Covenant. The Ark opening represents the occult knowledge from the gods being unlocked. <laughs> Yeah, man. Lucas and Spielberg are totally tuned into this shit. On its own, the bell couldn't do much, just hover. But they eventually coupled that technology with an air vortexing platform that was being designed by a different department. When completed, the vehicle took on an extremely familiar flying saucer design. After the war was over, Hitler and the SS took their designs with them to the South Pole where they built a comprehensive military base and a massive fleet of jets and flying saucers. The Allies scooped up as much technology as they could from Germany, along with a collection of Nazi scientists and engineers through Project Paperclip. In 1946, the US Navy took 4,000 troops and an entire fleet of ships and planes, along with troops from several other countries, to invade the Nazi-controlled South Pole in Operation High Jump. The American planes were absolutely outclassed by the Nazi technology, and they left defeated. Hitler no longer had an excuse to hide his technology. The cat was out of the bag, so the Nazis began sending out their saucer and stealth jets to harass the United States military. In 1947, one of these flying saucers crashed in Roswell, New Mexico, killing all of the occupants. The United States Air Force quickly covered up the crash with two fake stories, a reasonable one for your average Joe, claiming it was a weather balloon, and to confuse people who like conspiracy theories, they staged a leak of a fake story about aliens from outer space to confuse the public and hide the truth. The United States quickly started work on back-engineering the saucer wreckage from Roswell. A secret government group called Majestic 12 formed that year and took charge of the occult aspect of the technology, learning everything they could by communicating with the spirit beings, even facilitating building them fake bodies to possess. All of these beings need us and our energy to thrive. They need us to live. So the last thing they want is for humanity to die off. They actively disrupt nuclear weapons facilities. The United States 
military started building their own saucers at Area 51, but had little success at first. The Nazis continued to fly their saucers over the continental United States, and even made a show of force in Washington, D.C. by buzzing the Capitol in a Nazi formation. The U.S. has working technology now, but to this day, the Nazis remain the occultic and technological leaders of the world. They've infiltrated every level of government and are planning a fake invasion of the Earth. The Nazis will play the role of the invading aliens, and the fallen angels will pretend to come in and save us, fooling humanity into ushering in the New World Order, with Satan himself sitting at the throne, ruling the world from a temple in Israel. Or whatever, I don't really know. Thank you for watching. If you like what you saw and you'd like to see more Armored Skeptic, please like, comment, and subscribe. If you absolutely love me, you can support me on Patreon, or if you have a passing affection for me, you can buy my merch. Links are in the description.